This is Y'all Okay. I think it's fair to say we're all kind of profoundly touched by how people received us and the sense of community and um, humanity that we, that we encountered along the way. Um, and that, we, I, was, I just remember feeling just so hopeful and happy um, and excited for such a long time after the trip. I feel very good. <laughs> I mean, I, I do. I think they showed complexity. And I think they just showed how it was. Poor people helping poor people. Major county people. They didn't have anything to do with it, but they had the means to help. Howdy, friends and neighbors. Welcome to Y'all OK, the podcast about the state of Oklahoma and the people connected to it. I am Riley Ross. Long time uh, no talkie. Um, it's a pleasure to be back uh, and, and bring this special episode to you. That's exactly what this is, is a special episode um, unrelated to season two, where we left off and uh, finished off with the uh, wonderful Doug Sirocco. Uh, I've got a lot of great feedback about season two. And, um, you know, the, the quality of people that we've, we've brought to you. The reason why this episode is special is because it's not like anything that I've done before. Part of this is a live episode, and part of this is a discussion that I had with a filmmaker over the phone. So there's this movie that came out. It's called The Bikes of Wrath. It is the... The telling of a story of these Australians that come to the United States who want to recreate the path of the Jode family from the Grapes of Wrath um, on their journey from Salisaw or near Salisaw uh, to Bakersfield, California. Uh, The significance of this and the timing of this is is that the... um, and, and in fact, when we recorded this, it was back in April of 2019 at Rodeo Cinema. Um, but 2019 is, is now the 80th year since the publication of The Grapes of Wrath. And I know at some point in the telling of this story, I'm going to confuse The Bikes of Wrath and The Grapes of Wrath, but I will, I will do my best to, uh, to look out for that. So anyway... Um, yeah, so Rodeo Cinema down in the stockyards uh, of Oklahoma City had a viewing of this back in April, and I knew it was coming up, and so I reached out to Kim Haywood and asked her if uh, I could conduct a Q&A with one of the people that appears in the film. And one of the people in the film, uh, uh, up at the very beginning, it happens to be my father, Kent Ross, who's the owner of Al's Bicycles Northwest here in Oklahoma City. And, um, and she said, sure. Yeah. Happy to have you like the rodeo cinema. For those that don't know, if you haven't been, it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, down, down in the stockyards next to like right across the street from Langston's and, um, you walk in and they have like the concessions and stuff. And I believe they share the space with the Oklahoma Opry, um, or the rodeo opera. I, I, apologies to the Opry. I definitely know rodeo cinema, but it's just, it's, you know, it's, Absolutely beautiful venue. Um, They got the fantastic screen set up where they show a lot of, uh, you know, predominantly independent films. And um, I hear recently they they had a viewing of American Heretics. I don't know if it's called a viewing, but they showed the new documentary film about Mayflower Congregational Church, uh, also an Oklahoma City church. Um. Uh, they had that for a solid week. Uh, also, a fantastic film. Uh, in fact, they just rodeo just celebrated their one year anniversary of being open. So, congratulations to Kim and all the people that are affiliated with rodeo. Um, really, a gorgeous venue. Uh, and and Kim, who runs it, is so nice. It's definitely worth patronizing them, seeing some of the incredible films that they have to offer. So, anyway, back to the to the bikes of wrath. So. They had us out. They were happy to have us out. And uh, I also contacted Charlie Turnbull. Um, Charlie is one of the main figures of the film. 
and uh, he's one of the dudes that are riding uh, their bikes from Salisaw to Bakersfield, and he was extremely nice, extremely nice that you'll hear. Um, you'll hear that in the story. He actually lives in Austin now, and he was just so warm. Um, you'll hear he's very apologetic. Uh, uh, he, he had credited uh, my dad, so it's actually in the credits, but he credited Kent with being uh, Alan Webb, and Al owns the primary, I say primary, the original down on the south side, but uh, all of the Al's bicycles uh, in Edmond, Norman, south side Oklahoma City, and northwest Oklahoma City are all independently owned. And so, um, you know, just a local franchise, though. So anyway, there were a lot of different topics that we touched on in the conversations. So uh, the first part I'm going to play is me talking to Charlie uh, while he's on the phone. And again, he's on the phone and I have a digital recorder. So I tried to make it as clear as possible uh, through the effects that I have access to in GarageBand. Uh, but there are some limitations both to the software and my knowledge. Uh, I don't want to put that all off on Apple. <laughs> a lot of it's me. And then uh, then a live recording following the film at Rodeo Cinema. And um, the film touches on a lot of things. So let's see, they were, they were able to view the 2016 election, uh, at least in the, very, in the very beginning stages. You see some, um, I guess you would consider it, retrospective uh, foreshadowing. Uh, definitely some foreshadowing in terms of intentionally or inadvertently. It definitely mirrors a lot of the conversations around what you see uh, in, the, in the slightly earlier part of the... 20th century when uh, when Steinbeck as a journalist was looking out um, was chronicling the migrants and their journey uh, the Okies from the Oklahoma uh, Arkansas region those those affected by the Dust Bowl and their migration to Bakersfield or their migration to California um, there's a lot of discussion of topics of migration. There's, there's, we cover socioeconomics. We cover, um, you know, really, I'm honestly like the treatment of brown people. We look at guns. So it is. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a political movie. They do come into this uh, without um, too much of an agenda. It, it's a political movie in the fact that it's observational. Um, but it's not really, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a political movie, uh, because, you know, it just sort of shows their reaction, you know, their reaction as Australians to what their experiences are in Oklahoma, the Panhandle of Texas, uh, New Mexico. And it's not negative by any stretch. I mean, I think there are some shocking moments for them in terms of like, um, what they're exposed to, but you really hear it in, in Charlie's voice and you see it in the movie, like he's got a great fondness for the people that he encounters. Um, so it's definitely worth a watch. And I think they're trying to get distribution here in the United States so that people can view it in different formats. Uh, one of the things that they were able to accomplish recently in Australia is that they broke up the movie into a six part mini series that was, uh, shown on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, ABC. So kudos to them for that. Um, that's really wonderful news. I think uh, as a as an artist, you know, if you can secure uh, uh, at, at least distribution channels to to ensure that your art is viewed or this thing that you poured your life into is seen by more people, I think that's always a good thing. And so... Uh, congrats to them for that. And, and speaking of art and something that you pour your your heart and soul and your life into, you know, I ask that people go to Rodeo Cinema and patronize Kim and all the Rodeo Cinema gang because um, they're doing wonderful work for the city of Oklahoma City. And uh, and as more of these smaller theaters pop up, we're we are going to have access to. Uh, you know, greater and greater things. You know, when you think about Oklahoma City, we've we've had the Museum of Art. That's when I got exposed to um, a lot of more artsy films and more documentaries. And the Museum of Art is still is still wonderful. But with Rodeo Cinema, we now have more options. Tulsa, you guys got the Circle Cinema, and 
I don't know much else beyond that, you know? So I think the more of these we get, uh, we have to remember that like, they're not competing against each other, uh, necessarily from a business model. It just means that we as consumers are going to have a lot more access. And as Oklahoma city gets bigger and we get more and more people here, um, it's only going to benefit all of us. Like there's, there's plenty, plenty to go around. So, um, you know, and also big thanks to Al's Bicycles Northwest for, for being involved in this. And, you know, a few of those guys coming out to the, coming out to the show and, um, and basically just sharing this. So if you have the opportunity, seek out, seek out the Bikes of Wrath. It's a wonderful film. Um, go to Rodeo Cinema, get involved in bicycling, visit Al's Bicycles Northwest. If you want, you can email me at yallokpodcast at gmail.com. And, uh, and that's it. So thank you so much. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And that's it. All right, bye. Are we watching a movie? No, I'm going to watch Ken Burns. It's not really good. Right, you know think Ken Burns is good? I don't want to watch Ken Burns. You can't watch Ken Burns. I've got to say, I... I, we, our camera and I shot very bad. We, the whole time, thought your dad's name was Al. Hopefully he understands. Yeah, he understands. I mean, he's been doing it for 20 years. And, yeah, it, I think it comes with the territory. I mean, the place is called Al's Bicycles. So, like... Uh, it, I mean, he seems like the man in charge. He's very... Well, you can mention that on the evening, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um... So yeah, so I guess I'll I'll jump into it. Um, I, you guys have been doing a lot of screenings, right? I've been trying to follow the page. Yeah, a bunch. We've been doing heaps, actually. It's, it's, well, the big day is uh, April fifteenth. Um, so that's like about at least two hundred trains across the country, which is awesome. Um, oh, wow. And then so far today, we've probably done maybe forty or fifty in Australia, probably. 60 or 70 in the United States and maybe about 30 or 40 in Canada. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's going really well. People seem to, seem to be connecting well with it and, um, like, are very, are very keen to see it. Obviously, the cycling community is very well organized and enthusiastic, which, which really helps. Yeah, for sure. The, the cycling community is a, is a well-networked uh, and... and pretty good at uh, social media so um yeah, yeah definitely. they're pretty definitely. good so what i mean if you've had that many viewings in australia obviously being an australian film um and you guys yourselves uh uh you can get a lot of screenings going so what is like what's the cultural relevance of grapes of wrath in australia well i mean Culturally, like it, it's still a very well-known novel in Australia. Obviously, it's not as it's a, it's a classic American novel, not a classic Australian novel, but it's still read quite quite widely. Um, I think it was it was voted. There was this list I found um, uh, uh, taken by the public broadcaster in Australia of Australians' favourite books. And I think Grapes of Wrath came in at number thirty-three huh. um, the, of this big vote. So you know, it, it's definitely definitely not unknown in Australia, but I think more so those, those things that Steinbeck's writing about are so relevant everywhere, and to to write about, you know, wealth inequality and immigration and the dignity of work mm-hmm. um, and family right now, it's not only relevant here, um, but, it, but it's extremely kind of at the forefront of conversation in Australia and other places around the world too, and so I think um, you know uh, that those those themes speak to people no matter where they're from. At least that was my experience with the novel, and also the idea of um, you know of, of farmers and rural communities struggling and trying to move it to to you know find a better life. You know when when the land kind of is too difficult to make to grow food or to make money from is is a well-known kind of dynamic in Australia as well. There are, there are especially right now, there's a, there's a big drought in New South Wales, one of our states. And, yeah. Um, 
it's pretty it's pretty brutal on the land right now. So that element too is is, um, is definitely uh, kind of connection to Australia. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Yeah. That's that's a uh, that's kind of that's kind of a neat draw. Like, when did you? Um, when did you, did I hear in a podcast or a different podcast that you first that maybe I don't know if it was I don't know if it was you Charlie but someone first read the book like in high school and then revisited it later um, like when did you when was your first experience with it? Oh, so I first read it. I was actually out of school. I read it when um, I was traveling actually through Chile, and, a, and another traveler gave me the book. It was when I was about twenty years old. Um, so seven years ago now, and uh, I was I was just backpacking, and I started reading it, and I loved it, and I I then reread it a bunch of times, and um, my good friend Leon, who who is obviously in the film, he he really enjoyed it too, and we just found ourselves talking about it a lot, and then and then we thought, how could we do an adventure that kind of is in honor of this book? And you know, at first it started off really small. It was going to be a little bike bike ride or maybe not a little one but you know the idea for the documentary came later and, and really when we set out we had no idea what we were going to film it could have just been a straight cycling film but because of what happened on the way it became far more about those people we meet often in Oklahoma that um that were so incredible the film really became about them yeah cool so like so question about I mean you mentioned you mentioned uh, the people, um, and then I want to get into some filming questions. But uh, I, you know, I did hear in an interview, and I think it was uh, with like some, I don't know, some upper Midwest, like Indiana Film Festival or something like that, that you mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah, Heartland Film. Festival. Yeah, that's right. That you were uh, you were struck by the niceness and the openness of the people that you encountered, and I felt like I mean that's a that's a big theme in the book, like poor people sharing with poor people, even though they don't have anything. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like so, uh, I am curious uh, from an Australian perspective: is there an Australian version of like what we would consider as a redneck or some sort like a hillbilly cultural yeah, outsider yeah, type? Totally, totally, yeah, that we got we people. Well, I guess we call it a bogan, a b o g a n, huh. um, which is which is kind of derogatory, as I guess redneck is maybe, um, and hillbilly too. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, there's definitely, and it's rural, it's away from the big cities, people that, you know, work the land generally, and again, they've got, you know, there's an idea that it's, um, they're kind of, not really, kind of backwards and not as, not as progressive as people who live in metropolitan areas, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, I think in Australia as well, often, often they're, they're up a hell of a lot kinder and the sense of community um, in those areas is much stronger. Yeah. Were you conscious about the story, uh, about the story process and like, not specifically the book, but like, you know, your story, uh, you know, a, a typical film, even if it's a documentary might have a, a conflict, a hurdle they got to overcome, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. hero's yeah, journey no, type of thing. Yeah, the hero's yeah, I, I think we, we really weren't, to be honest, and we hadn't, that's kind of what I was trying to say earlier, we didn't know what we wanted to capture, we didn't set out to capture anything in particular, really, and, um, you know, we, we knew it was going to be really hard, it was a lot harder than we thought, so that, that was, I guess, good for the challenge element of the film, um, but really, we, we, we were kind of just trying to get there we were so tired every night and we filmed every day and then we got to the edit room afterwards and we had 160 hours of footage and uh we we kind of looked at it and we're like okay what what is this now like how what are we going to turn this into and that's when kind of we we realized that there was you know a, a pretty um a pretty nice like uh undulating storyline of ups and downs highs and lows, people that we meet who are real kind of angels throughout the story. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, we, there was definitely a sense on the road, like, we knew that it was going to, we had something when everyone we spoke to was just so generous and kind, and we knew that was really cool. So, um, 
we we kind of I think pretty early on we we probably saw that that was something we'd like to share with the world you know something that maybe isn't shared often enough right um did you guys feel like so uh, you know I've read the book once and then sort of like tried to revisit parts of it and stuff like that and I've always I've always hoped uh that I was probably like some sort of enlightened less ex- less eccentric version of uh Pastor Jim Jim Casey yeah <laughs> or that maybe I would be like I don't know like a stalwart like Ma but did you did you guys ever feel like um uh, do you, you more closely aligned with one character in the book or anything like that? Yeah, that's funny. We, we often, at the end of the day, we often ask who we thought we were that day, like, uh, before going to bed. Um, and for sure, sometimes, sometimes your ma, like, looking after everyone, cooking dinner, and um, sometimes you feel more like um, Casey or Tom or, um, but like, any of them that... Um, What's his name? Uncle, um, oh. what's his name? Uncle, uh, Uncle John. So yeah. he goes off one night and has to go and get, has to go and get completely wasted <laughs> on like two dollars just to get away from the group for a while and to get away from reality, I guess. But yeah, no, it, it definitely varied, you know. Um, and it was interesting watching those, like watching, reading the book and doing the trip and thinking about the, characters in the novel along the way and how we I mean we, we, we didn't fall into exact characters but we definitely fell into like a family vibe which was which was obviously what the, the Joe family had yeah f- yeah for sure um, so you mentioned the the physical challenge and so you know I think the furthest distance I've ever I've I've had a few days where like I've I've ridden sixty miles uh, back to back, and then I had one day where I rode like a hundred and twelve miles. But uh, for you uh, guys that haven't had that didn't, uh, I understand that you didn't do a ton of training. Like that was one of the funny parts of the trailer. And I, I again I haven't seen the screening. But what do you what was the most f- uh, difficult physical aspect of riding? Uh, so I, I, yeah, I mean it was. The first week was really grueling, and we hadn't done any training, um, and it was a lot harder than we thought. I think I think probably just the relentlessness of the trip. I mean, we had we had one rest day in there, so we rode kind of seventy mile a day for twenty nine days. Um, so just doing that on the body, it was really difficult. And then obviously in the in the middle of the American summer through the Mojave Desert, it was, you know, like 110 degrees all of the time. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, we really, we, we picked kind of the harder time of year to do it and none of us were cyclists. So <laughs> it was, it was, it was definitely tough. And then also, you know, we had a ridiculous amount of gear, way too much gear, um, which is kind of a, a funny storyline in the film as well. And that just made, that just made us so much slower and things so much harder and, I mean, it's just a perfect, perfect combination of difficulty because then obviously we had only four hundred dollars, so we couldn't eat as much as we liked. So that you know, it was, we didn't have as much energy as we would have liked. So it, the, the whole thing rolled into one, made for a pretty difficult trip. Yeah, dude, that's uh, that's absolutely insane. There is a uh, um, there is there is a for every new cyclist that's out there. I think uh, from my experience at the bike shop, one of the things that the feedback that I always heard for anyone that's new is like how much the like bruising and chafing and just like general annoyance in the groin area uh, that would happen. Yeah, yeah. How did you guys Absolutely. cope with that, especially on top of oh, everything else? That was a lot of bruising and a lot of it was it was it was really uncomfortable actually. Like there were days where you just kind of get comfortable on the saddle, like you just felt like you were shifting around all day trying to trying to feel slightly more comfortable. But yeah, I guess I mean, like how do we deal with it? I guess you know you set out to do the thing and you film in it and. You're trying to make a documentary and you're trying to get to Bakersfield, so you just kind of get up and go every day, and it's kind of uncomfortable. But you're with your friends as well, and yeah, it, it just you kind of just, I guess, get on with it and and do it. And um, 
you know, it was offset by all the amazing experiences we had. Okay, yeah, all right. Um, so I understand that it was perhaps you or, uh, um, so I can't remember who it was, but that at least one of you hasn't ridden since the trip. So, um, and that's, right, un- that's, yeah. un- that's understandable. Has, have you revisited, uh, the book since your trip or, um, uh, you know- yeah, I mean, I have in the editing process because we use a lot of quotes from the book. So mm-hmm. I've read it again and, um, you know, I'll in, in obviously in a completely different life after having done that that uh, journey. Um, so that was really interesting, actually, to read, and you kind of... You, it almost breathes even more um, understanding into the novel, and it seems, like, far more profound, and I guess we were... I was reading and thinking of all these experiences we have on the road, and, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seemed like a completely... Not a new book, but uh, I accessed a, a different layer of understanding, maybe, which is really, really cool. But I think I think now I'm I'm probably done with the Grace of Rats for the next few years. So yeah. I think I need to read it for a, for a little while. Yeah, uh, I totally hear you. Um, all right, so this this will be my last question, I think. Uh, and in in the book, like so to to you know dig deep or not too deep into it but you know the grapes within the novel are this metaphor for you know the finer things to come the greener grass that's going to be in california and so like they're the grapes of like hope and and opportunity but by the end of the novel uh that's when they become the grapes of wrath because it's not what they thought it was it's just it's it's been a shit process so uh did you, I mean, did you have grapes at the beginning of this? Like, at the start of your process, did you, did, were you hoping for something? And then what, what did the grapes end up being for you? Well, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was probably the opposite of the, of the Joe family. And we're very, very lucky and thankful for that. I mean, we, we, it's kind of the opposite. We didn't know what to expect. We, we, we knew, we, I mean, we were just so excited and so thankful that we could as five friends get on bikes and have this incredible journey across the United States it's hard to explain you know day one it was like I had no idea what's coming ahead I I, I, I do not know what this trip is going to be like so expectations were not low they were just unknown I guess but then by the time we got there we were all I think it's fair to say we were all kind of profoundly touched by how people received us and the sense of community and um, humanity that we that we encountered along the way, um, and that we I was I just remember feeling just so hopeful and happy um, and excited for such a long time after the trip, um, and 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 I still feel that now going and attending screenings and seeing how people react to the film, um, and so yeah, I mean for, for us it's. I mean, those grapes at the end were, were sweet and delicious, and um, <laughs> we we were very, you know, it, it was it, it couldn't have gone any better, and it, you know, it's, it's changed our lives. You know, this is what I do now, and, and we've we've followed up with a, a second documentary down the Mississippi River, um, and that's going to come out next year, and and um, all because you know this one little idea we had maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. So, um, like, if people are hearing this and they want to stay tuned into what you're doing, like, what the movie is doing and what you guys are doing for future projects and that sort of thing, like, where where can people go? Yeah, I, the best place to to go to stay updated is definitely our Facebook page. So it's the Bikes of Brat, um, and we're also on Instagram um, with that name too. Uh, and then feel free to get in touch via a message on on that page. So we normally respond pretty quickly. So if you'd like to, you know, ask any questions or um, make any comments or, or even try and set up a screening, um, please do get in touch. Uh, and I live in Austin, Texas, and there's a chance I might be able to make any any screenings in the down here in, in um, I guess, the Bible Belt. Um, and yeah, so please do reach out and get in touch, and and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the film. 
All right, cool, man. Well, I I, uh, I really appreciate you trying to you know like make the time uh, to talk to me and record this and uh, uh, yeah, I just appreciate it. So um, enjoy Big Bend. I haven't been down there, but it looks awesome. Yeah, yeah, and no, I will. I'll take some photos and uh, good luck with the screening. Hope it goes well and say hello to everyone. And I, and I do really wish I could have been there, um, but next time. Yeah, will do, man. All right. Thanks so much, Charlie. Have a good one. Cheers, Riley. Thank you. Bye. So I talked to Charlie uh, Turnbull earlier in the week because I told him what we were doing. And he was, oh, let me make sure I'm recording here because I would feel like you don't even... You don't even know what I would feel like if I missed out on that. So I am recording, um, and I talked to Charlie, and he, uh, the first thing he said, he was like, uh, first of all, I love the Australian accent, um, much better than uh, any other accent, but he was uh, profusely apologetic, because he was like, uh, um, I'm sorry, we, we've been calling your dad Al this whole time. That sounds exactly like him. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Going in 21 years, everybody calls me out. I use, use that as a filtering tool. If they come in and tell me, Foster, they know Al real well. <laughs> he knows they don't know Al real well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good way to do it. Right, shout out to uh, Ryan Foster, who also makes an appearance in the room in the background as well. Um, I, uh... Towards the end of the film, so let's start at the end of the film first. Uh, that fellow with the YouTube channel, Rodney, uh, was talking about how lucky he is that they uh, got to cross paths. Uh, you know, as you look back, um, I mean, what are, what are your feelings about how these guys, thousands of miles away, were able to come into your bike shop and you were to share part of that journey and part of their story? It's mind-boggling to me. Uh... I've had people in my 20 years of doing this come through on crossroads, crossways, east, west, west, east. I've never heard anything like this. And to be honest, after meeting them the first time, I really wasn't sure if they'd ever make it or not. They really, well, as the one guy said, he had only ridden about 20 kilometers as far as he's ever ridden. And they, didn't have their trailers, they were still buying their instruments, nothing. Which, for those that don't know, so let's provide some context to it, so using the metric system versus the standard. So 20 kilometers, 20K, that's, uh, let's see, multiply that's 16 by 20, miles. 16, yeah, so 16 miles, so that's nothing. Um, so to not have the training like that, uh, yeah, I feel like that's incredible. Um, uh, as your son, and one that doesn't have this, I feel like you've got a very distinctive voice, and so whenever, uh, whenever it opens up when you're off camera and I hear as I'm like looking down and taking notes, uh, why are y'all going to Salisaw? Or like, what, I, can't, I can't remember what it was, but it was sort of like a sarcastic smart aleck why in the world are y'all going to Salisaw? Um, uh, especially for dudes from Oklahoma, any traversing eastern Oklahoma, and you know, apologize. Nothing, no offense to anyone from Eastern Oklahoma, but I think that's a good question to start off with most of the, <laughs> most of the time. Um, what do you think your biggest challenge was going, uh, going from Salisaw? Was it the physical? Was it the emotional? Like, what were you expecting? I don't think they, from my experience dealing with riders and all that, I try to tell them about the win, that when they got west of Oklahoma City, it was not going to be another bike shop because they got to Amarillo. After Amarillo, it would probably be Albuquerque before the next one. There are just not that many bike shops, and I don't think they had any idea how the wind would blow when they got out on the planes. Yeah, absolutely. And that made the move. They weren't used to those winds. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've done a little bit of riding, and I've had back-to-back -back days of 60 milers, and I had one day of 112 miles, and most of that was in eastern Oklahoma when we were living in Broken Arrow at the time. But yeah, this wind is, it's killer. I mean, we don't have mountains, but uh, we have winds. So if you're ever looking for uh, some resistance training, 
Um, I, I'm curious about, so we come from a lineage of, of uh, farmers, and uh, that was mostly in central and even, you know, slightly, slightly west of here, um, but, not, but not too much. Do you remember, like, with your family, like, with Papa and me, Mom, for those who don't know this, Grandma and Grandpa, like, did they ever talk about uh, the Dust Bowl much? I mean, I'm interested in, like, the historical context a little bit. No, they were both born in 28, and where they lived was on the very edge of the worst of it. Most of the worst was still to the west and back north of where they lived. But they did talk about it. In fact... I laugh about it at my house because everybody turns the coffee cups upside down and I ask why we did that and they said, well, to keep the dust out. So they were used to that. Uh, my dad grew up very poor. He never really, really talked about his childhood too much. It was pretty brutal. Yeah, there was a, uh, a breed of people in Oklahoma that are currently still being poor, but yeah, talking about the emotions and the past history and stuff like that. Uh, wouldn't be done, and I think there's even <laughs> the fact that they were actually talking about a film in front of people who, who paid money to see it would also, Papa would wonder what the hell is up with that, but he wouldn't say it that way. Um, so, I, I was struck by their view of um, uh, of Oklahomans, not just Oklahomans, but their view of America, and I think there's probably a certain uh, comfort in like distance that you can get being an Australian, um, but do you think that they did justice to how they edited the film and their portrayal of Americans? There's this term, and so if you're if you're wondering, is there an Australian term for redneck? And there is. It's called a bogan, B-O-G-U-N. And I asked Charlie about this, and um, uh, and and he said it's a lot of what you would you would you would also expect the same thing from a bogan, like poor people taking care of poor people. Uh, that sort of thing, but there was also the juxtaposition of like, you know, there is this historical context in Oklahoma of socialism around the, the, the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, and poor people taking care of poor people, um, but then there's also like the very conservative side that they showed in the film of, of you know, not t- trusting the government and that sort of thing. So do you think the Australians... That is a long explanation to say. Do you think these Australians did a good job of, uh, of portraying? Do you have any issues with the way they portrayed the complexity of these figures? No, not really. In fact, I think their distance helped them. Uh, what can you say? You're that devoted to the greatest of wrath, you're going to have to go through some of that. But I think it really shows us in a pretty positive light, especially the people of Oklahoma and the generosity. And I think that's what you find where you go. And then, of course, when you get out and about, there are some bogans out there that you will bump into, especially when you're riding a bicycle across the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I I wonder how it's going to be perceived. So whenever they take this film back and they do festivals in Australia or or somewhere else, I wonder, like... um, Whenever they see the fellow, I can't remember his name, but the fellow that had the trailer in New Mexico and was like, yeah, you can sleep up there. And he, he had the gun and the American flag behind him and stuff like Buck that. Buckskin Dan. Yeah, Buckskin. Yeah, that's right. Glad you can remember that. He, uh, but yeah, he was an interesting character. And I think like knowing a lot of interesting, eccentric Oklahoma characters uh, of... Kindness and generosity and this and that. Also, like, with the religious language, with the guns, with the not trusting stuff. Like, I figure, I mean, that's an interesting character. And I got to assume those are the people you grew up with as well. (laughs) Speaking of where you grew up with in Lindsay, Oklahoma, I don't know. Yeah, I've known several of them. Yeah. And in a former life, as you know, I used to travel to Salisaw pretty regular about every other week for during the race season. And so I met a few eccentric people over there, too. Yeah. So knowing that and knowing your closeness to it, are you, are you comfortable with it? Or do you got any uh, – do you, do you feel – I guess, yeah. So do you, it's okay if you do feel good with the portrayal and the complexity in which uh, they show that. I, I feel very good. About it. <laughs> I mean, I, I do. I think they show it. Complexity, and I think they just showed how it was. Poor people helping the poor people, and amazing how many people 
Did they have anything to do with them that had the means to help them? Do you think that they did um, justice to... Um, do you, how do you feel about uh, the justice that they, they did to uh, talking about the issue of uh, migration, migrants, um, maybe even the artistic choices of you know, editing Be Real of like guns and, and that sort of thing? Well, I think that's the Australian influence. I think there's a, I mean, migrants is a very hot potato issue right now, very hot political issue, but I think the deal with the guns and all that, I think we just have to admit a lot of the world looks at us with our guns and wonders, what are we doing? So. Yeah. It was interesting to me, the guy, uh, Red, I, I don't know his full uh, Moroccan and French name, but Red, um, and like how they how they kind of like showed his discomfort with it, and I think to to not like dig too deep into that or anything, it was just um, uh, because of the fact that he hasn't grown up around it and lived in those places, he's very uncomfortable with it. Um, that's not necessarily a commentary one way or the other. I thought it was just a a, a pretty. Um, what do you think about the timing of the trip? They came over in May or June, and by the time they got to that panhandle town uh, in Texas, they were having their July 4th celebration, which meant they were probably towards the end of July uh, or mid to end of July having to cross the desert. Well, it's been my experience that most people go west to east when they're riding a bike across the U.S. because it gets warmer west to the south, and so that they can ride into the cooler temperatures and get, get away. But that was also why I was worried about the wind, too, because when no heat waves pick up and the wind starts flowing, it's a pretty dehydrating experience pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally have, have always been felt, um, not necessarily drawn to asceticism, but I think, there, I think there's an interesting uh, idea in trying to um, do fasting or some sort of like put yourself uh, this sort of like self-imposed suffering to <laughs> to achieve some sort of enlightenment, not necessarily like a religious enlightenment, but just to, to come to some sort of a, um, I don't know, thought or look at things differently. Um, it, in your, in your experience with the bike shop, I know that when I worked there, which has been a long time, we had a few people ride across the country. Uh, I distinctly remember one couple of dudes that was riding from San Francisco or somewhere near the Bay Area down to Florida and like receiving, which was also insane, but as you say, ride from west to east. Um, do you think there's a... Um, is there, I'm trying to ask a question about like the novelty, uh, it almost seems like for many of us, those who are in a, like a financial position to do it, uh, is, the, is there a value in doing the novelty of taking on this cross-country trip uh, as opposed to the people that were, felt like they were forced in a position to take the trip. Like the, even though they're fictional, the Joe family it was based off of real experiences that Steinbeck uh, uh, observed as a journalist. So, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that in general? I think if you got the time and inclination to do it, it's fine. Uh, what you see is a lot of people will not do it the way they did. Going fully self contained is a very unusual way to do it. Like those two kids that came through, they were pulling bog trailers with all their stuff in it. You see a lot of them in part of a tour group or something where they don't, they have, they're not self-contained, a lot of other stuff is done with them and for them. But I think on the self-containing, it just shows you, it forces you to get out and meet people. Plus, the way they went, the route they took, as we know, when you get out there, there's a little wide spot of road every 10 or 15 miles. So that gives, gives you a chance to see those and not just what you see from the interstate. Which, by the way, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, for those of you guys that have done cycling, uh, whenever you have to ride on the side of the road, like <laughs> next to cars, highways, shoulders, if you ride from your bike shop, which is the Northwest Expressway in MacArthur, out to Okarchi, there's a shoulder for most of the way, 
But those semi-trucks that are driving by will scare the hell out of you. And I, they didn't talk about it enough on the film, and I feel like, I feel like, oh man, that would have been, I would have talked for at least 15 minutes just about the semi-trucks and the, the fact how scared you can get. Uh, that in itself, I imagine, would be amazing. Um, you don't have to comment on that if you don't want to, but if you got something. Well, no, if they're coming hard enough and fast enough and close enough, the back draft can knock you over. Yeah. You know, so it is a pretty big hazard. Yeah, and what I've noticed uh, uh, going out Highway 3 is they quit mowing all the way back to the shoulder. They let the grass get overgrown on the shoulder, which makes it even worse. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys can experience something similar to that if you ride your bike around Lake Hefner in a counterclockwise fashion. They've also let the grass grow. Uh, next to the dam, so that's kind of what it feels like but with a uh, 75 mile per hour semi truck right by. Um, well, this, is, uh, this has been really good. Um, if, for those of you that want to know, I've got a little uh, update on Charlie and I believe Cam. Uh, those guys are living in Austin now, and um, uh, I guess just making film, making art, that sort of thing. Actually, whenever I talked to Charlie, he needed to, he needed to talk on a specific day because he was going to be uh, not whitewater rafting, whatever you do in Beaver's Bend that's down in the hill country, but he was going to go like rafting and kayaking down in Beaver's Bend for like six days. He's not going to film it. Um, <laughs> he's with his wife. Um, did he say anything? But did he say anything about his Huck Finn project? They were going to build a raft and go down to Mississippi at one time. <laughs> All right, so everybody can Google that. <laughs> Charlie Turnbull, Mississippi Huck Finn project. Um, well, that's all I got. I really appreciate you doing this, and thank you for doing it. If you guys want to know more about Oz Weiss's in Northwest, it's at 7930 North MacArthur Boulevard on Northwest Expressway and MacArthur, a block north of Northwest Expressway. Um, you got anything else you got to say? Thanks for having me. All right, thanks to Ken, thanks to the Rodeo Cinema, thanks everybody uh, for coming out. I uh, really appreciate it. Is that good? Great. Thanks. Bye.